G'day guys, welcome to Super Little Challenges. I'm Daniel Thomas and my guest today is Christopher Glatis. Chris is the author of the book, When Your Mind Screams, Finding Peace and Confidence in the Midst of Anxiety. We talk about Chris's own experience suffering anxiety and the simple tools, ideas and philosophies he has created that can help sufferers face their anxiety head on. I suffered anxiety particularly in my early 20s and though I've since learned to embrace it, I'm sure I would have appreciated Chris's insights at the time. Enjoy this one, guys. Reading a bit of background about yourself, it's fair to say that anxiety has been perhaps one of your biggest challenges in learning how to navigate that. Would that be fair to say? I would say that that going down uh, this journey that I've been on, which hasn't ended. I mean, it's it's a constant thing. I mean, you have to, I have to show up every day um, in order to to meet, you know, whatever comes up because it, it, it's sneaky. Anxiety can be very sneaky. Yeah, I've I've had my own my own struggles with it as well. Um, and you're right. That's that's why I use the term navigate as opposed to overcome. As mm-hmm. you say, it's it's a it's a day by day thing, and that yeah, you're right. It can be it can be sneaky. Um, what was the what was the defining moment for you where you realized it was impacting your life? I think you know when I went to when I left high school and went to college, things really started to ramp up around that time. Um, I think there was probably some separation anxiety. I had a lot of friends that were in. They were one year behind me. So when I left, it was like I was leaving all my friends. I was leaving. Um, I had a girlfriend at the time and I was kind of stepping into this kind of unknown. Um, and I think things have been brewing for a while. Um, but that was kind of the 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 straw that broke the camel's back. And I had a pretty bad panic attack. Um we have an we have an event that's called Beach Week that when you graduate high school, there's a week where everyone, all the seniors go to, to the beach. Um, I don't know if that's similar in Australia. And so well, I was in a car and I just had this overwhelming kind of dread and catastroph- catastrophic thinking. And I just didn't, I had no idea what was going because I never knew anything about it. There wasn't really a lot out there about uh, any sort of anxiety disorders. Uh, there were books that were clinical that were mostly about what's going on in your head. It wasn't really how to, I guess it was a little bit of how to deal with it. But, um, and I think for men, you know, what I'm learning now is the book, I think, is speaking to men because um, men tend to keep things bottled up. They don't speak about their feelings or their emotions. Um, so that was another big challenge being eight, you know, being 18, 17, 18. Um, and, and having this idea of what a man is and, um, just kept everything bottled up. Little did I know that was just making everything worse. So that, that period of time in my life, um, you know, things really ramped up. And that's when I think I first reached out to a psychiatrist. Cause I was like, you know, I didn't know what to do because my parents weren't really there to, they loved me, but they were kind of absent emotionally. And so I had to kind of navigate that myself, which again, just made it even more um, frustrating and scary for me. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting you say you were kind of caught in, in catastrophic thinking and overwhelmed and it had been brewing perhaps for a long time. I, I can relate to that. So was that first, I think it's common that that first panic attack is so visceral Um it's sort of like the world's ending in a way. Is that what it was like for you that first time? Oh yeah. And it was, you know, I read about it in the book and I, I was in a car and I was, you know, it was a time of my life graduating and supposed to be a lot of joyful time and celebration. And, and we did, so we did a lot of that, but you know, we're in a car, we're having fun. The windows are open. It was, um, you know, it was, it was a bunch of our friends and I'm looking at them and I'm seeing them smiling and, playing music and I'm like, what the, you know, do I need to tell them to pull over right now? You know, because this is, this is terrifying. So I remember when we got, I got out of the car, I was like, you know, 
I, I felt better just because it, it felt a little claustrophobic in the car, but getting out. But then what happens is, and I don't know if you experience this, is that you're just waiting. You're like, when's that going to, like, what just happened and when's it going to happen again? So you create this ant, uh, anticipation of the when the next time it's going to happen. It just it just builds and builds and builds on, on, on top of each other. Unless you have some sort of knowledge of what is going on and how, or some, you know, some tools to, to deal with it. Um, and not to mention, you know, back in the day, you're drinking, you're doing recreational drugs. There's all kinds of other things that are being thrown into the mix that just can also exacerbate um, uh, the situation. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a really scary time. And, you know, up until that point, going back to what you just said, I think once that happened and once I had that panic attack, I was able to look back like a year or so and be like, oh, I, and then I can see I saw the signs, you know. I can retroactively go back and see how this was building. Um, I definitely had some, never really suffered from depression, but at that time of my life, I definitely was feeling, um, you know, depressed and kind of stuck and feeling numb and approaching the end of high school um, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I didn't know, you know, not having, feeling that I wasn't emotionally and mentally fit. I was like, what am I going to do? I'm going to college. How am I going to manage this? You know, so it was just a lot of, a lot of, uh, thoughts and f conflicting feelings. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was complicated. The, the irony of it happening in a, um, in a hat, call it a happy or celebrate celebrating environment, I think, is perhaps common that you know there might be cliches that okay, anxiety is going to happen in a in a, a difficult situation naturally, but like you said before, it's sneaky. So when everyone's having a great time, suddenly it creeps up on you, and like you said, it then can become a a perpetuating fear of when's this going to happen again and it and it's starts to kind of feed itself sure and you know i i what i realized is it wasn't just fear that i struggled with because you know these feelings come up and i you you, you bottle you know i bottle them right and so it just creates this pressure cooker um but what i realized is that it wasn't just the negative emotions feeling a lot of joy or too much joy was anxiety creating for me because it was like it, it was just an emotion that just felt too much you know and and it, sometimes that's hard to understand but it, it's um it's almost like a, I'm trying to remember I wrote also about it in the book there's a there's a, a gay gay Hendrix I think uh wrote the book um I'm not, I'm not able to, to to remember to uh, I think it's um I'm trying to remember It'll come to me, but there's a thing called upper limits. And it's like, if we are, we put these, um, it's like a governor on, on the emotional system. Like can't too feel, I can't feel too much joy. I'm not going to allow myself to feel too much joy because I'm either not, you know, I, I'm not worthy of it. I'm not allowed to all these things. And so you start to feel this joy. And then in order to stop that, you create some sort of drama or you bring in, in bring in, bring in anxiety. It's kind of like um, the other shoe dropping, you know, that cliche saying, when's the other shoe going to drop? You know, this is, this is too good right now. When's, you know, there's something around the corner. Right. And that's a really common um, thought process for anxiety sufferers. Um, because, because they feel anxiety so much in their lives that any joy feels different and feels in anything that feels different creates anxiety, right? So one of the chapters in my book is called the fear of no anxiety. So that's that kind of, that kind of speaks to what I'm talking about. Like if I'm feeling calm and peaceful, something's wrong, something's up, you know? Mm. Um, so um, yeah, yeah. Joy is, is is something that um i've also struggled feeling because it's um it feels so unnatural and um i think there's part of me that doesn't allow me to feel it mm, that's uh yeah that's interesting it doesn't necessarily matter what 
the particular emotion, it can still have the same triggering effect. Um, yeah, and and what you what you said about this, perhaps at the moment uh, appealing more to males is is on point. I think mm-hmm. not to not to discount women who are suffering anxiety, but I think you know often women when they're going through something they get together and they talk about it you know mm-hmm. they pick each other up and they and they they talk it out and they, but as men we just we we really don't do that so much and um yeah i don't i don't know what the statistics are between males and females but um f- f- for me I, I can just relate to what you you're saying it was a long time build up number of underlying things going on that weren't addressed and when that all has to spill over at some point in some way shape or form uh, especially if the well-being's not being looked after um yeah so how 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 did it impact you in other ways creatively and so on I mean, I think it's, you know, when it hits and when it happens, it's such a dark cloud. You know, a therapist once told me, like, when the light switch is off in the room, the lights are off, everything is dark, right? So it just, it just, um, it just permeates everything in your life, you know? And so I, I do, you know, you bring up, you know, um, creativity, which, you know, obviously that's a big part of my life as well. That, that I was able to channel, um, some of these emotions, um, like when I'm writing, I'm very free to just let things flow and not hold back and not keep that stuff bottled up. I think writing is one of the, you know, journaling, you know, people journal. So, you know, the, the one way to kind of, um, when you're feeling these emotions, whether it's anxiety or it could be depression, if you start just journaling or just even like stream of consciousness, putting that on a piece of paper, putting that out in front of you on a computer, it has a cathartic kind of um, effect. And you're able to kind of, it might not make a lot of sense, but when you're able to get it out of your head and see it in front of you, it's really helpful. But for me to be able to put that into stories, um, was really helpful. I would get into a flow. And so that was, that was kind of a solve for, for my anxiety, but you know, it, it, it permeated every area of my life, relationships, um, you know, career stuff. Um, it was, it, it, when you, when you're not feeling good, you just don't want to do anything, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and, um, or you just want to run from the anxiety or manage it and get away from it. But as I said in the book, it's what I learned over the years is it's it's moving towards it and leaning into it as scary as it is. I mean, I had a I don't know last week I had a moment where I was like, oh, here I was like, all right, I'm here again. You know, but I know I've been through it so many times and whatever whatever was happening at that moment that triggered it, it really didn't matter. But I, 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 you know, I brought up my toolbox and I was able to. you know, to sit with it and allow it, because when you do that, it runs its course through your body, right? Instead of, because to me, running from it's just bottling stuff up. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it can be very overwhelming uh, in all areas of your life when it's happening, because it just um, y- you feel like you have no ground to stand on, and. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but a lot of anxiety is from the neck up, right? You have your minds doing all this stuff and and we're really not feeling our bodies, you know? And so that's another thing is to get into my body and really feel what is going on in my body right now. Is my heart beating? And you can kind of walk through this system of, of grounding yourself, feeling this and letting it kind of off gas, you know, is, is a good word. Um, and everyone's different. Sometimes you do need to, sometimes it's so overwhelming. You do need to just like completely distract yourself or run from it. That's fine. But if you can develop the muscle of sitting with the most uncomfortable feelings, um, I found that really to be a key to unlock all this. Mm -hmm. And, And of course, having a therapist, having people to kind of guide you through this is always helpful as well. Um, so 
Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but that was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, lean, leaning into it. Um, it's hard to lean. I think it's hard to, it's maybe a hard concept to lean into something when there's so much fear uh, around the thing. Um, but yeah, to encourage encourage people to to lean to lean toward it. And and you're right, it's not a it's not necessarily a static thing. And for me also just writing and, and get even if that writing is thrown away, the process of, as you say, getting it out there and getting it on the page can be just quite cathartic. It doesn't have to have a have an outcome. It's the act of of putting it down, putting it down on on paper, which is so beneficial. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so your book is When Your Mind Screams. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't read it, but I'm going to. Um, you you seem to have quite quite a you've you've simplified it in a way, how to how to heal. Um can can you talk about that a bit more? How how you've ha, did you not had you not seen other resources or perhaps resources that just overcomplicated it and you've kind of tried to stream it down a little bit? Yeah, like I said. I kind of tried to write the book that I would have loved to have had when I was younger and that spoke in a more um, informal kind of conversational way and, and really like I just all the things I've done in my life, you know, different modalities, whether it's therapy or psychiatry or, um, I've dabbled a little bit in psychedelic therapy. And so there's so many different modalities and, and every day there's something coming out. There's a wearable, there's, you know, all these different things. And I, and I was like, what are all these? And I, I, you know, I've studied a lot in the, in the, um, the Buddhist traditions and meditation. And so I, I lean that way. Um, but if I look at what everyone's saying, if you look at the Stoics, you know, Buddhism, you know, CBT, modern psychology, they all have, there's all a, there's always, uh, there's some similarities between all of them. And I was like trying to figure out like, what are the things that they all say work, you know, or, or have, they've had good, um, you know, the percentages of the people that have been healed have been pretty high. Right. And, and simplify all that down. Um, and then, you know, kind of build, I built the book around, it's basically these three ideas, these three sections of the book are breathe, observe, and let go. And I think that the breath is, is so very vital. Um, and, and it's really the starting point, because if you're, if you're, if you're in your head, if you're kind of discombobulated, um, you're not going to be able to get anywhere. Right. And so breathing, slowing down your body, slowing down your breath and really landing. And I think what ultimately happens when you, when you have some sort of breath work practice is it brings you into the present moment. Right. And once you get to that present moment, you can then do all the other things that I think are really um, helpful. And the second part would be, observe and that could be like i said journaling it could be uh therapy it's really understanding the the stream the the mind stream the thought stream that's going through your head and because a lot of that majority of that is not true it's not um it, it's it's it could be from childhood trauma it could be from just you know people that were really important in your life when you were younger but just understanding okay this is what's going through my head um, is it true? Is it false? You know, I mean, it's really kind of as simple as that. Um, and then the last part is what I call let go. And that could be anything from changing up your routine in your life. Like I, I'm a creature of habit. I think people who suffer from anxiety, like if they know what they're doing every day and they have a pattern, they have a structure, it feels safe, but that safety can be a double-edged sword because you 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 don't go out of your comfort zone and um and that i think inhibits growth right so letting go could be changing up routine it could be you know doing something really scary you know um climbing a mountain you know so it's it's letting go of just the the normal routine but it's also 
what I said before, letting go of like being able to just sit with those uncomfortable feelings and go, you know what, I'm going to be okay. I'm just going to let this go. I'm going to sit with this and be with it. Let it run through my system. And then I'll come out the other side of it. The one other part of this I'll say is that in psychedelic therapy, um, specifically if you get into some of the heavier stuff, I, I've, I've done some MDMA therapy. Um, I recently did a ketamine session session. And you really, there is really is a, a letting go in that because you have something, a, a substance that's really pushing you really fast and really hard to a place that might feel uncomfortable. And you have to just, you know, that's what the therapists tell you. They're just like, look, no matter what comes up, know that you will be back. You will come back. You will be okay. You will probably be better than you were when you started. Um, so the let go section gets a little um, esoteric. Um and talks about um, how all these different ways that letting go, what that could look like. But I really try to be simple um, throughout the book and just simple, because I think simplicity, a complexity breeds anxiety. Um, and like I said, leaning into it and ultimately not, it's really not the anxiety itself. It's how we respond to it. Right. So if we have this anxiety coming up in our system, if we don't, if we, if we don't lean into it, if we kind of run from it, it just tends to, tends to grow. Right. Um, so yeah, that was, and it started from journaling. I started journaling and then I'm like, maybe this is a book, but it needed a lot of refinement and needed structure. And, um, and then, uh, finally I, you know, I, I, I put it together, got a developmental editor to help me quite a bit. And, um, and, uh, and now we're here. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I've also tried a number of different, um, uh, therapies, not so much the, uh, psychedelic side of things, but one that was beneficial to me actually, which took me by surprise when I was younger was the, um, uh, EMDR, the, the rapid eye movement, mm -hmm. I think, is yeah. it EMDR? Um, yeah. yeah so a, a counselor had suggested it and I was quite open to it. And, um, I think, I perhaps it's for the listeners. It's not, it's not like hypnosis. It's, it's sort of, uh, reading eye movement to try and bring up some potential past traumas. And I, I was a little fearful that, that some of the bigger things I'd been through might come up in this session, mm -hmm. but exactly like you say, she, she was like, you know, if you, if, if you see something or, um, don't fight it, just go with it just go with it. And I met, I was able to do that. Um, and the thing that came up was actually quite a small thing. It was just falling off a, a skateboard when I was, um, when I, and I had actually, uh, forgotten or suppressed that memory, but it was obviously very traumatic for me as a child, this accident on this skateboard. Mm. And so that actually brought, uh, brought that, that, that out. So that was one short, short session that kind of was very, um, very helpful. Cause I've also done, uh, therapy. I've, uh, and I think therapy takes courage also, but it's also just great to have somebody who's not emotionally invested to have an objective look, um, at things and be able to piece things things together and say, Hey, why don't you perhaps try this? But what's also been beneficial is, as you said earlier, is bringing the body into it. I've found great benefit when I've, uh, not just been in the head, but brought more physicality into, into stuff, trying to get into the, into the body, like you say. So there's so many things to, to, to pull from, but I haven't, I haven't delved into the, um, psychedelic side of things, but I'm, I am curious. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's scary. It's scary for me because it's, it's such a, I, you know, again, I think anxiety suffers, they want to be in control. Right. And, and that's the thing that brings up the anxiety is you feel like you're out of control and you feel like your mind is just, you know, out of control. And so, um, I think that there's, um, different ways to approach it and and to approach it in a way that is safe and that you feel safe you know i mean i think some people you know they go in and they do these heroic doses of you know and, and everyone's different everyone you know what one person might need 
a lot larger of a dose of something, but might experience the same thing that you might experience with a lower, you know, with lower dose. And there's different, you know, for, for, for different things that people struggle with, there's different medicines. Um, and I'm, again, I'm just, I've been dabbling in it. I've been interested in it for a long time. Um, and I think it's pretty remarkable that these substances that were kind of, you know, demonized back in the sixties are now making a comeback. Um, and, and some people are having remarkable breakthroughs and going off medications that they've been on for, for years or decades. Um, so I think it's a really interesting area. I, I also think that, um, what I, you know, at least in probably the past few years, I've been doing more of a, um, my therapy has shifted into trauma therapy, which is, it's much more body centered. And, um, it took me a while to really get into it and understand it. And I, I talk about it a little bit in the book, but I think that that's, um, I think that it's good to have like a regular CBT type of therapy to understand what's going on with your mind. And that's really important. And I, and I say that you get to a point, I don't know if you reach this point, you get to a point where you, you kind of, or at least I did, where I felt like I was just repeating the same thing over and over. And it was really the neck up. And I wasn't really getting any sort of gains. I, I think I felt like I hit a wall. And I think the reason is, is because of all this stuff is stored in the body and you really need to get into the body. And, you know, I work out quite a bit. I think it's another way for me to kind of feel my body. Otherwise, I'm just in my head all day long. Um, but yeah, therapy is fantastic. I think that um, and and you just got to be careful not to make it a crutch, because I think some people you can just rely on that and you lean on that really hard. And um, again, it keeps you in that comfort zone, that safety bubble. Um, but it's, it's, it's fantastic. And I think at least at first you need to have someone that can, like you said, can see you objectively, let you know, you're okay. You're not broken. You know, if you had a broken arm, you go see a doctor, right? It's, it's, you know, if you, your mind's got some things going on and you're seeing a doctor um, and, and, um, you know, I, so I think that you take all this information and then if you can, if you can shape it into some, like a, like a, your own toolbox, like that's another thing I say, like, this is the way I did it. And I think it'd be, it's very beneficial to, to others, but you also can shape it into what works for you, you know, and, and, and find what works for you. Um, because I think that there's, there's so much to grab from. Yeah. We're all individuals obviously. Um, yeah, the book sounds like an awesome resource for somebody who might be, uh, feeling, I, I just remember feeling like, you know, is there an end to this? Like, you know, going from a very active, social, busy person to almost not being able to function, you know, overnight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so the book sounds like an awesome resource for somebody who, who may be in that, um, you, you, you know, that kind of overwhelming, uh, state where, where can people find it? Um, well, you can go to, it's on uh, Amazon. I can send you, you know, I can send you the links, you know, to put up on your, when you post a podcast, um, you can find and go to my website, which is cryptoproglatus.com. Um, you can see all my work there, the book, links to the book. Um, Amazon, you just punch in when your mind screams, it'll come right up. I think also um I think the the not iTunes, but um um I, I think it's just called books now on Apple. Get it there. I think Barnes and Noble, um, and also I think some of the stores actually have the hard copies in there as well. So um, yeah, it's pretty much everywhere, anywhere where books are sold. Did you go through a, a standard, through a publisher or did you self publish? So this was a hybrid publishing, uh -huh. um, process where I, I had a, um, it, 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 it's kind of the, I think it's the way things are going nowadays what, because publishing is so hard. Like it's, it's really, it, it's at least the top publisher. It's very, very hard to get, you know, um, support from them and even to get them to read the book is is impossible and a lot of times they want to just read a proposal which is not what i did i, I kind of went the did the did the did it backwards 
But there's hybrid publishers out there. Um, if you can find a developmental editor that, you know, a developmental editor for me was the key to the kingdom. I mean, she showed me, you know, guided me, helped me shape the book. Um, so it's a, it's a, it is a publisher called Houndstooth Press. And um, the, the, it's, it's like more of a hybrid model where you, the, the author gets to keep more of his royalties and, just has more control over the book too, because the publishers will kind of change and tell you what they want to title it and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm f- I'm familiar with the hybrid. Uh, pro- it se- it seems like a a good middle middle way to go. Yeah, no, it's it's, yeah, it's yeah. I, had a, I had a wonderful experience. I just did the publishing part of it, but some of these companies will you know they'll they'll ghostwrite. They'll they can help you at any stage of where you're at. Mm, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on the show, I like to if suggest ch- uh, potential challenges for the listeners. Um, do you have a not to put you on the spot, but uh, relative to to anxiety, do you have a a small challenge that that the listeners could try? Absolutely, yeah. I think it goes back to what we were talking about before. I think that, and this can really be any emotion. I mean, uh, I don't know if you're in a relationship, but you know, there's certain times when I'm, you know, with my wife, and I get these really strong emotions that come up. And sometimes I, you know, I, 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 there's no control over it. I say something stupid. It just comes, you know, it just comes out. I, I'm, and then I, and after I'm like, why did I say that? So anxiety is very similar, right? I mean, anxiety, when it comes up, we want to distract ourselves. We want to run. And that, that purging, you know, me saying something to my wife is a very similar, very similar to kind of running from the anxiety. Right. So, and, and this could be, you know, some people can are, are probably, you know, farther along than others, but I would just say that, and I'll, I'll keep it to anxiety, but again, it can be other negative emotions as well. Um, that if you are feeling fear or you're feeling, you know, when you were climbing that mountain, I'm sure there's moments that came up where, you know, that brought some fear up for you. Um, fear, anxiety, self-doubt, like um, a- any of those negative feelings. I would just say, if you could just, if you have the ability to, to pause, sit down, just get quiet for a couple of minutes and just listen to that and see if it, it, sometimes it's telling you something, sometimes what it's actually, you think it's telling you, it's not telling you. But to be the ability to to allow your body to um, have a sensitivity and not be overwhelmed by this and be okay, I can sit with this and it's not going to overwhelm me. And I can, you know, what's going to happen is when you come out the other side, you're going to feel calm. You're going to feel you're going to feel peace, which is really it's a really interesting if you just let it run its course. And again, some people might be at work, but you can still do it probably at work. You know, if you just have a moment, you can go to the bathroom. You can do it at the bathroom. So. To be able to sit with uncomfortable emotions over and over and over again, I think can help people, not just anxiety sufferers, but but any anyone, you know. Um, now I take a pause with my like what like a pause if I feel like I'm gonna say something to her. I have anger coming up or whatever. Pause, breathe. Okay. Um, oh, that's what that's about. That's when my mom, you know. That's when my mom said something to me when I was a little kid and I got pissed and, you know, and it just, it's clarifying your body settles down. Um, so, and, and this works like dipping your toes in the water, then getting it up to your ankles, then getting up to your knees. So certain things are too overwhelming or too, it could be trauma coming up like, like capital T trauma, which is very old. So just to summarize, just to be able to, even if it's 30 seconds, to just pause and sit with that uncomfortable emotion and not try to distract yourself. Go into your phone. Like I do that too. I I catch myself all the time. If I'm feeling uncomfortable, I go to my phone, you know, or I'll go to, you know, the refrigerator, drink a cup of coffee, you know. Um, Does that that fit into the, to the, to your. Yeah, for sure. No, no, okay. for sure, for sure, and it's it's a big one. It, it, it's a big one. I um, I know that uh, you know the kind of no filter thing where if I just kind of blurt this out, then that will. You're right. It's almost like a fight or flight response in a different. You're, you're kind of verbalizing it, but yet having an awareness in those moments and and taking the time to to sit with it and not 
not get pulled away by other things and just again lean into it lean in, lean into what it's what, what's it telling you what what is it it's, yeah and even even fidgeting even fidgeting like scratching like all those things are distracting and off gassing an uncomfortable feeling in your body you know mm. and look when i'm saying this i'm talking to myself too because i gotta do this every day I, I do this every day i did it this morning so um it's challenging and um it could be done in bite sizes and um and and don't beat yourself up if you, if you don't think you're doing it right I think that was that was another thing was yeah this idea of a quick fix you know how how do I just quickly fix this and get on with my life but actually no it's it's um something that's that's kind of here to stay and that's cool it's just about uh um yeah about navigating it in the in the best the best way you can and challenging it and and um yeah this idea of a quick fix is flawed i think that's my oh yeah and and i you know i think that when i really look at it as maddening and frustrating as it's been over my lifetime it's pushed me to really explore myself in a very very deep way that i never would have done if i didn't have this issue if that makes sense mm -hmm. right so it's you know i've had there's a whole there's a chapter where i write down all the benefits the things that i've gotten from having anxiety and from compassion to others that are suffering to um you know deeper exploration of myself my creative i think my creativity has come out of that so um and yeah like you said before you asked yourself is this ever going to end and i think it's i still don't have an answer to that i know that it gets better and i know that it gets um there's a there's a deepening um, of the, of the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, there's a deeper understanding of yourself and life and um, what people go through and challenges. And, um, and, and it, you know, like any challenge in life, it, it strengthens you on some level. Right. And so um, I don't know if it ever goes away. It, it, it I think it, it, um, I think the relationship that you have to it changes. Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And kind of, you know, accepting and almost embracing it in a way, which sounds, which sounds crazy. You know, how yeah. can you, how can you embrace something that so can be so debilitating, but right. um, yeah, it's, it's a very delicate and nuanced, nuanced thing, especially, especially for somebody who's going through it. But as two men who have been through it, um, I think we're, we're qualified obviously to, 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 to talk about it, but obviously everyone needs their own individual ways of, of getting help. But I very much appreciate your, your openness in the way you talk about it. It's just, it's, it's quite inspiring the way you, you're just very, very clear, clear in talking about it. You, there's no, it doesn't seem to be any insecurity with that. And that that's, that's an awesome thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, that takes work too. I mean, I think like I told you when I first was experiencing this, it was the complete opposite. You know, it was, if anything, it was trying to, you know, um, what's the word, I, you know, my ego was, cause my dad was a very type A kind of like get it done. But, you know, he was, I always looked at him at the model of what a man was and, um, and I love my dad, but he also, I think he was, he was keeping a lot of emotions down that he wasn't showing. So I think I compensated sometimes for that in being, um, just not myself, you know, trying to, make myself bigger than I was or, you know, working out all the time, making my body look a certain way or, um, you know, maybe even telling stories that weren't necessarily true about things that I've done in my life. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that was, a, a that was a, a mask that I was wearing for a long time. And now understanding through people that I've listened to and mentors and all that stuff is that the strength is in the vulnerability. You know, it, that's where true strength is. Um, and I think that, you know, how you, you look at, 
you look at vulnerability in yourself and you, you, you it's scary, right? You're like, oh, I can't do that. And then you look at it in someone else and you're like, wow, like you're impressed by that. You know, it's like we look at it in other people as it's a great thing. And then we can't, it's very hard for us to do it ourselves. So um, I think what you're doing, podcasts, you know, nowadays you have all these podcasts and people talking about all these things more freely, right? Unedited, long form, which is beautiful because it allows people to really understand um, what people are going through. And um, like I said, unedited, really just raw, as opposed to back in the day, you might have people being interviewed and it's all about the, you know, it's not really, it's, it's, it's about getting viewership and, you know, asking certain questions that are yeah. going to bring more viewers and it's not really about the truth. So um, I really appreciate what you're doing. Yeah. Cheers. It's also, it's also awesome that like two males, yeah, I think it's progressive that two males can have this type of discussion, you know, it doesn't take away from our, uh, call it our masculinity. It's, um, you know, the, the fact that more, more, more dudes are having these types of conversations is, is a sign of progress too, I think. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a different world now. And I don't know what it's like where you're at or in Australia. I, I had a sense in Australia that people were a little, especially men were a little bit more buttoned up. Um, but in, being in LA, it's, it's obviously, this is where it all starts, you know? Um, it's, it's classic for me actually, cause I'm in Germany. I'm an Australian in right. Germany. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, as <laughs> I could really go, go away. Oh, you know what I want to say real quick. What I was yeah. going to say is that, you know, a lot of the group work and stuff I've done here, a lot of Germans, a lot of mm. German men, I mean, they're very open. Mm. I think they, there's this idea that, you know, I'm not trying to be stereotypical. There's this idea that, you know, Germans are, you know, very kind of, you know, like almost robotic, um, but they're very interested in this, this stuff. There's a lot of contradiction I find here. And, yeah, the thing about German males is they are they're very literal and they're very reliable. So they they really won't say something unless it's so you you can really you can often count on on uh German males to kind of stick to what they say because they you know um so yeah, I've I've I I have found contradictions to the stereotypes whereas mm. whereas in Australia we you know we're obviously we, we're very open and i think there's a lot of progressive stuff around mental health for sure there maybe isn't so much here like i think therapy here in germany is still a kind there's a lot of stigma around that mm -hmm. um in australia obviously not but in australia we're we're so open in a way that sometimes it's a bit you know it's a bit too much and we don't know where we stand it's like you meet someone and you're like, Hey, I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I'll email you or whatever. And it's kind of just doesn't happen. But when it, when a German, uh, dude says it, it's like, you know, you know, that that email is going to come, otherwise they're not going to say it. And I've sort of, I'm learned cause I've been here 10 years. I'm, I'm finding a nice balance between the, the two. I'll never be, I'll never be German, uh, uh you know, but I'm, I've been away from, from home, long enough now that there's kind of no turning back in, in, in that sense, but the a middle between the two cultures is, is quite nice. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's, um, yeah. It's, and as you were talking, like I, I've been in, you're right. There is, there's a, there's also a little bit of a split in Australia that I've seen. I mean, I, I definitely in the business world down there, it, it maybe I haven't gotten close enough to these guys, but it just seems, you know, business and, and, you know, sports and there's certain, you know, there's certain things you can talk about, but in some of the, um, I was in a virtual men's group and we had a lot of Australians, a lot of Australians were in. And so there is that, you know, there is that. thank you so much for your, for your time and your insights. And I'm definitely going to check out the book in depth and, and recommend. And I, and from what you've said, it really seems like an awesome resource. Um, and I wish, I wish I'd had that type of resource, uh, many years ago when I first started to take anxiety head on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, man. Well, yeah, it was wonderful to talk to you. What you're, what you're doing is really fantastic. And, um, hopefully we can connect down the road. Mm -hmm.